Hello, this is Teacher Dominic at Phuket Pals. Today we're going to go through one of the social studies exams question by question so you can get an idea of what to expect when you sit your exams. Let's jump right in it. Throughout the video, I'm going to tell you when you could pause. It's a good idea to pause the video, read the question carefully, read the text or look at the infographic, and then make your decision on which answer is most appropriate. Then, resume playing the video and we'll discuss it. So let's begin. You can pause now to read question number one. Question number one states that according to the regulations described, all of the following could be uh, could legally be used to deny a minor employment except the answers are A age, B gender, C hazard level, or D the type of job. Looking at the text, we'll see that it does mention the age, as in 16 to 17 year olds, 14 to 15 year olds. It also mentions hazard level and the type of jobs which they could do. The only thing that is not mentioned is B, gender. So B is the correct answer for this question. These two questions are related to the previous text. Which of the following religious beliefs is the basis for the regulations? And question number three asks, the most support for the passage of the FLSA came from, and then it lists the people. So go ahead and pause the video and have a look at this. And let's go back to the text so you can have a look at that again. Okay, I hope that you've had time to look at it again, and let's discuss our answers. So for number two, minors should judge the appropriateness of their own employment. This idea is not in line with the theory of the text at all. Uh, B, employment of minors must be controlled to protect them from harm. This is exactly what it discusses. Uh, C. Minors should not be employed under any circumstances. This is completely nonsense when reading the text. It is all about their employment. And D. School children should focus on their studies and not be burdened with, a, with jobs. Again, this implies that children should not work, and the text is, is describing how children should be, be protected while working. So the answer is B. Number three. We're talking about the most support for the passage of the FLSA and who it likely came from. A. Factory owners. Factory owners are unlikely to regulate themselves. B. Child protection agencies. They would be concerned with children's working conditions, but the text also mentions wages and other factors. C. Workers unions. Workers unions would be interested in protecting children, and in wages. C is the correct answer, the most likely answer. D. Small companies, again, doesn't entirely make sense as large factories or small companies alike are unlikely to regulate themselves. Here we have a timeline that we're going to use for the next questions. Uh, this is about post-World War II. So have a look at that and pause the video and then we'll move on to the next. Okay, I hope you had a chance to read through all of the information in the timeline. And we also have a map. This map is showing which nations controlled which part of Germany in post-World War II. So we have two questions. Why was the Berlin airlift necessary? And what event was the response to the formation of NATO? Let's go back and look at the timeline and then we can have a good chance of guessing correctly. So, they asked us about the Berlin airlift. This was in response to Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin's attempt to block supplies to Berliners. France, Britain, and the United States launched the Berlin airlift to supply the citizens of Berlin by air. And they also asked us about NATO. So, 
1949, we created NATO, the Western, Uni Western Nations Unite, in order to resist communist expansion. This does not tell us about the Soviet reaction. However, the Warsaw Pact beneath tells us that the Soviet Union and Eastern European communist nations united to oppose NATO. If we go back to our questions, we should be able to answer now. So the best answer for number four would be D. They told us clearly that the Soviets had closed the supply routes and that the point of the Berlin airlift was to supply Berlin. Uh, the other answers, though some may make sense, are not factually accurate, such as C. It was not the Warsaw Pact that prevented Berliners, even though it mentions preventing them from getting supplies, it's not the correct historical event. And question number five, what was the response to the formation of NATO? And the correct answer for this would be A, the communist countries united under the Warsaw Pact. That was clearly written in the last line of the timeline. So this, one, uh, this question asks, based on the map, which of the following statements is true? Let's read these questions before we have a look at the map and I'll let you pause. So it says, the United States controlled a larger part of Germany than any other nation. The United States controlled the southwestern portion of Germany. Great Britain controlled must, much of East, Eastern Germany. And Joseph Stalin controlled only a small portion of Germany. If we look back at the map, we can see that the only possible answer that could be correct is that the United States controls the southwestern portion of Germany. We can see by the flag indicating the light gray color that that is what the U.S. controls. The U.S. did not control a larger part of Germany. Great Britain did not control any of eastern Germany. That is controlled by the Soviets, as we can see by the flag. And Joseph Stalin controlled a larger portion of Germany than any of the nations mentioned. Here we have a question based on a short passage. Go ahead and pause the video and you can read the question, the passage, and the potential answers. Okay, I hope you had a chance to read over all of that. I don't want to stop talking for too long or the video is going to get really long. So, the correct answer for this, which of the following historical developments best supports Grant's conclusion, is D. The emancipation of the slaves affects the society of the entire nation. This one makes the most sense. You could use the process of elimination to get rid of a lot of these answers. So nowhere in this short uh, passage does it even mention the North. So A cannot be possible. B, in 1917, the United States ended the First World War. The date at the top clearly shows that we're not even to that year yet, so it's not valid. Again, we could just glance at C and see the date, 1919, and know that it's not correct. But also, this does not discuss voting or women. So D is the only potentially correct answer. Again, go ahead and pause and read about the 24th Amendment. We have another short uh, passage and then we'll talk about the answers. Okay, so question number eight states that the 24th Amendment states that non-payment of taxes cannot be used as a reason for denying any citizen the right to vote for president, vice president, or a member of Congress. This amendment to the United States Constitution upholds which of the following common principles? Looking at the answers, A, no taxation without representation. That's a little bit tricky. It does mention taxes, and if you've been studying for the GED, you probably have read a lot about taxation without representation in the early colonial period. However, it's not related. The 24th Amendment is about voter rights and not taxation. Taxation is just a factor 
in determining who can vote in this passage. All citizens have the right to bear arms. It does not mention any of that. The right to bear arms is the Second Amendment. That is not correct. C. A person guilty until a person is innocent until proven guilty. Furry had slipped there. Uh, no, there is no mention of any of that either. D. One person, one vote. Yes, this makes the most sense, as even not paying your taxes is not a reason to, to deny your vote. Let's look at question number nine. Okay, go ahead and read this short passage as well. Pause the video, read questions nine and ten and their answers, and then we'll discuss which ones are right. So this question is about men going to the West during the gold rush, seeking fortune. It says that many of those men who failed as prospectors settled in towns. Towns in California, San Francisco, and Monterey. And it talks about what they did there. They found jobs working for canneries, or booming, working in the booming fishing industry, or just digging in gold mines that someone else had found. So which of the following best explains why the men described in the passage traveled west? Number nine. To live near the ocean? Uh, that does not make any sense. That They traveled in search for gold. To start families? Again, families are not mentioned. For economic and other opportunities? This is the correct answer. Because they went looking for gold, and gold is going to give them a fortune. D, to escape religious uh, persecution, while well, could make sense as why people would settle west of the established areas, it just is not mentioned and does not make sense as the answer. Question number 10. According to the information, which of the following is a conclusion that best explains why many of those who headed to west settled in coastal towns? As I mentioned earlier, much of this passage is about jobs. So let's read the answers and see which ones could be related to jobs. Bingo. Answer A, the first one. They were able to find jobs there. That's pretty clear the answer, but we're going to look for the other, the other answers as well. There was no available land. Well, this does not make much sense as it was the new territory and there was a lot of available land. Uh, Monterey rivers were rich in gold. This could be a bit tricky, because it does mention Monterey, and it does mention gold mining. However, it says that they were digging in gold mines, not in rivers. And the mountains were not open to settlement. Again, this is not mentioned at all. So A is the correct answer. Another short passage type question. Please pause the video and have a look through the uh, text and the questions. Okay, so it tells us that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right to, of the people to peaceably, uh, of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government. Well, these are some pretty basic freedoms and we know which document this came from. Question number 11 says, which statement describes the primary purpose of the First Amendment? A. The First Amendment protects the right to bear arms. Nah, that's just not mentioned, and we know that's the Second Amendment. B. The First Amendment increases the government's restriction of individual freedoms, such as freedom of religion, of speech, and of the press. This is saying the opposite. It does not increase restriction. It's saying that it may not restrict. C. The First Amendment protects essential individual freedoms, such as the freedom of religion, speech, and of the press. If we look through, all of those freedoms are mentioned in the passage. C seems to make sense. But let's check D anyway. D. The First Amendment prohibits Congress from making laws. It does not say that. It says which laws. That is not specific enough. So C is correct. Hope you got that right. This is a fundamental document, the Constitution. We should be very familiar with it. 
Looking at number 12, all of the following are guaranteed by the First Amendment except. So A, freedom to vote. There is no mention in that passage of the freedom to vote. B, the freedom to petition. It tells us that the government, uh, the citizens can petition the government. C, freedom of speech. That is also mentioned in the text. And D, freedom of the press, right next to freedom of speech. So the one that is not mentioned is the freedom to vote, A. Keep a close eye on the questions when they use bold, such as accept or not. These questions could be uh, made incorrectly if you do not notice those words. All right, question number 13, we have a different type of question. We're looking at a pie graph. So pause the video, have a look, make sure you read the title of the graph uh, chart, sorry, and look through all of the information contained in all the text. Okay, getting right on to it, it says, which statement is supported by the information in the graph? And so the graph tells us how children are being educated. That's the title. And that tells us which forms of education they are receiving. Public school receiving 39.2%, private school making up 31.5%, those being tutored at home at 13.8%, uh, 13 cooperative learning at 10.1%, and other at 54 so private schools provide a better education than do other types of schooling. While we may believe this is true, this uh, graph does not indicate quality of education, just quantity. Children prefer the educational arrangements their parents have made for them. This tells us nothing about children's preferences. Tutoring at home is the most, ex is the most popular method of educating children. This is factually inaccurate because it makes up only 13.8%. And D, most children attend either public or private schools. This is correct, right? Because we have 31 point something and 39 point something making up 70% or almost uh, three quarters of all children's education. So D is the correct answer. This is one of the easier questions on this test. Let's look at number 14. Okay, 14 and 15 are about the text on the right. This is a rather large text, so go ahead and pause the video, read through it, and let's discuss the answers. Okay, I hope you've had a chance to read it and analyze it. So, 14 is asking us to infer information. This is one of the more challenging skills that we need to develop for the GED test. It says, it can be inferred from the passage that which of the following would not be found in a pure market economy. So they're asking us to infer which of these would not be found in a market economy, a pure market economy. So, as you probably know from reading or your previous study of the GED content, a pure market economy would regulate itself. So money controls all, governments do not intervene. Monopolies. Monopolies could very well be found in a pure market economy. So A is not correct. We're looking for ones that would not be found. B, small businesses. Small businesses would definitely be found in a market economy. C, unemployed workers. Well, I think there'd be unemployed workers in any economy. It's just part of life. Some people don't want to work or they don't have the opportunity. Not true. D, taxes and welfare. Taxes and welfare are forms of government control. This goes against the principle of a pure market economy. D would not be found. 15. Of the following groups, which would probably benefit the least from a transition from a market economy to a socialist economy? So a market economy would be regulated mostly by the currency, the businesses themselves, and the spenders, the consumers. A socialist economy would be controlled, as the passage tell us, tells us, to try to create equally wealthy members. So A, government employees. Government employees would probably be the least affected because they are already part of the system. B, the unemployed. 
they would probably benefit the most because they would be guaranteed employment and equal pay. B, uh, C, small shop owners with small profits. Again, if everyone was getting the same amount, those who had less before would benefit. So small, profitable, uh, small profits would be increased. D, highly skilled labor. D is correct. They would be in the upper echelon of society and they would probably receive less money for their highly skilled labor. Okay, 16, we're gonna look at a photo, read a short passage, and then make a decision about which of these answers is correct. Go ahead and pause the video, have a look, and we'll talk about it. So 16 says, while today's car owners sometimes have difficulties, car owners in the early 20th century had to cope with quite a number of different problems. Which of the following would have been the biggest concern for the people shown in the photo above? So they give us some valuable information. It's the early 20th century. I think automobiles were invented in the last two decades of the 19th century. And we can see a car here, which is, I believe, a Ford Model T, the first car. It's old. Infrastructure is probably lacking. Either their car is broken down, or it's out of gas, or they're pushing it for fun, or it's a crazy photo. Who knows? Let's have a look at the question. Which of the following would have been the biggest concern for the people shown in the photo above? A. A lack of unleaded gas, which resulted in pollution. There were less cars. Pollution was not a concern yet. A does not make sense. B. A lack of seatbelts and other safety features. Uh, Let's keep that one on there. That could be a possible concern. C, a shortage of lightweight building materials which led to much heavier cars than we have today. Well, they are pushing the car. That could be valid. A scarcity of gas stations. Well, question answers B and C could make sense. D stands out as definitely the most likely since they are pushing the car. This is the answer, D. Have a look at 17. We have a long passage. Go ahead and pause the video and read it. Uh, read the question, read the potential answers, and take a guess which one you think is correct. An educated guess. Okay, so question 17 says, according to the passage, why did many African Americans migrate to the North in 1879? Uh, A, to seek religious freedom. That's not mentioned in the text. B, to find employment in factories. That is not mentioned in the text either. There are no factories. C, to escape poverty and racial discrimination. This is the main idea of the text. Uh, D, to escape lynchings. Again, lynchings are not mentioned. So C is the correct answer. Question 18 has us looking at a chart graph, sorry, and trying to decide which statement is the most correct. So have a look at that real quick, pause the video, and then we'll talk about it. So 18 asks us, which statement is clearly supported by evidence in the graph? A. American women perform better on the SAT than the American men do. This does not tell us about performance, it tells us about the amount of people taking the test. Uh, B. There has been a decline in the number of Asian American men taking the SAT. We do not have a timeline, so there cannot be a decline. This is a snapshot. C. The number of women in general taking the SAT has increased. Again, this does not make sense because we don't have time in this infographic. D. More women than men take the SAT. D is correct. If we look across the board, women take Women from every ethnicity except Asian American take the test more, and the only one which they don't take the test more, they take it equally. 19. This is going to tell us about a plutocracy. Go ahead and pause, read the, what a plutocracy is, read the question, read the answers, and let's discuss the right one. Okay, so 19, it tells us that a plutocracy is maybe divined by 
rule of the wealthy. Those who have the most wealth uh, or property are ruling and have the right to vote. This would be similar to what we get in Rome uh, or ancient Greece as well. So according to this statement, which of the following is inconsistent with a plutocratic form of government? They've underlined inconsistent for you to emphasize it. So A, citizens must abide by the decision of the select group in power. Uh, this could make sense. B, monetary interests are valued above human interests. This is not discussed at all in this short passage. C, leaders are determined by popular vote. Uh, this goes against the principle of the passage uh, because there's no mention of popular vote. Popular vote would mean every citizen would have the right to vote. This tells us that power is controlled by a select group. So C is inconsistent with the plutocratic government. Let's have a look at D anyway. A farmer is excluded from holding office. Uh, this is not mentioned either and it goes against the principle since those with property would ideally be the ones who have power. Question 20. Have a look at the small text and read the question and answers. Decide which one you think is correct. So, Mr. Mellon writes about oil monopoly, and we are asked, which of the following is an opinion most likely held by Mr. Mellon, the speaker above? Uh, if we look at the text, he says that he uses some negative words here, uh, and unwise would be one of them, unwise public officials. This is already showing his leanings towards the public and against politicians. So let's look at the answers. A, those who profit from, from monopolies should not try to serve the public by running for office. Uh, he may have had that opinion but we're looking for the most likely. So let's read them all. B, the interests of the people are secondary to those of public officials. That would be opposite of his opinion. C, all should profit from the rewards gained by a monopoly. That does not seem appropriate. He's advocating against monopoly. D, public officials value the interests of the people, should value the interests of the people they serve over the interests of any, other, any one business. D is correct. D makes the most sense. It's the most likely opinion that Andrew Mellon would have. 21. Another very similar type of question. Again, pause the video really quick. Read the text. Read the question and answers. Okay, question 21 asks, which of the following best illustrates how the wagon wheel analogy applies to the U.S. system of government? This question requires you to understand an analogy. You've had to use this with RLA as well, so you should be able to apply an, an analogy of a wheel to the central government with state governments around it. Let's see which one makes the most sense. A wagon wheel is one of four wheels needed to stabilize a wagon. This does not make much sense since we're talking about one individual wagon wheel. B, the hub and the hub of a wagon wheel holds in place the spokes which strengthen the structure of the wheel. That sounds very much like what we are describing above. C. A wagon wheel's hub and spokes are made of different materials. That's irrelevant. D. A wagon wheel is created in several pieces and then assembled. Well, this could make sense as the analogy. B is more suitable to the U.S. government structure. The answer is B. For question number 22, we're going to be looking at this map. Go ahead and pause the video and have a look at this map. Read the title, look at the key for information, look at the different colors represented, and the states are written for a reason. Here we have questions 22, uh, 22 through 24, which are all about the map. So which of the following best explains the distribution of non-English speaking children shown on the map? And the correct answer for this would be D. Recent immigrants to the United States have tended to settle in coastal and uh, border and coastal areas. If we look back, Texas is a border area. California, Florida, and New York are all coastal areas, and New York is also a border in Canada. 23. 
Which factor would have the least effect upon the distribution of English-speaking children in the United States? Uh, the answer for this one is B, climate. If we look, these are in these states with 10 or more of the non-English speaking children per, per county would be in cold and hot states. So climate is not the determining factor. Uh, which generalization is supported by the evidence in the map? And the answer for this would be D. There are few non-English speaking children in the northern middle portion of the United States than in other parts of the country. Looking back, back we can see the northern central have none. They have zero non-English speaking children in those counties. Questions 25 and 26 are about this passage about the Constitution. Go ahead and pause the video and read, and we'll discuss which ones are correct. Okay, I hope you had a chance to read it and you understand the passage well enough to answer questions 25 and 26. 25 states that, uh, asks, which of the following is an example of the concept of supreme law? Supreme law is the law of the land, the law that cannot be violated by any branch of government. The correct answer for that would be B. The freedoms outlined in the Bill of Rights can't be denied by the government. 26 asks, which of the following is an example of a state law that would be incompatible with the Constitution? A says, a law that prohibits protests by a steelworkers union. In the passage, it tells us that... Oh, I'm sorry, that was a previous passage in the Constitution. <laughs> okay, so A is correct. because the other questions just don't really make that much sense. A law that lowers the speed limit would not be a federal law, that would be a state law. A law that limits state senators would again not have to do with that portion of the Constitution, the Supreme Law that would be set up in the previous part of the Constitution. And D, legislation that requires reductions of emissions would be again a state law. If it was a federal law, it would not be about the law of the land it would be created by one of the governing bodies under the Constitution. 27 is simple. Which of the following is an example of a law compatible with the Constitution? This is one of those questions where you need to have factual knowledge. You need to understand the Constitution enough to answer this. So A, legislation that prohibits the practice of certain religions. This would not be compatible because legislation is not allowed to limit religious freedoms. B, a law that protects the rights of convicted criminals. This would be an example of a law compatible with the Constitution. Many of the amendments in the Bill of Rights deal with being uh, convicted of crimes and how criminals are to be treated. B is the correct answer. C, a law that suspends the right to trial by jury. That would be unconstitutional. There is an amendment dealing with this. D, a law that prevents non-English speakers from voting. There is a law that states, there are amendments that state that all citizens can vote. Your language does not matter. Okay, question 28 deals with a very large passage. Go ahead and pause the video, have a look at it, and look at the question and answers, and see which one you think is right. So this is about economics, and we're asked, after analyzing the success of long-term stock predictions, some business professors reported that, and in the passage they tell us that it's extremely unpredictable. Uh, predicting stock performance is like likened to predicting weather patterns. Again, they are not very accurate. So let's read and see which one we think is the best. A. Professional predictions of stock performance are usually accurate. It says the opposite in the text. B, stocks that are currently performing well will continue to do so. Again, it compares the stock market to weather. Weather changes. This is not correct. C, amateur stock investors do very poorly in long-term investments. Uh, although I, we may agree with this, it's 
Not the best answer for the question. D, even careful analysis of current stock performance is no guarantee that accurate long-term predictions, of accurate long-term predictions. This is very much what the passage is telling us. D is the correct answer. 29, it is true that a company's performance is affected by many factors. Sorry, if it is true. One can conclude that, and so they're asking us to draw conclusions. A. Two companies producing the same goods will perform equally well. Many factors would indicate that they won't do equally well because it's impossible to predict. B. A company's success is dependent on amateur investors. This does not make sense. Amateur investors would be not guaranteed to be successful and less likely to be successful. C. It is possible to lose money by investing in a company that has been very successful. Since the previous passage told us that it's highly volatile and things change like the weather, this makes sense. This is true. There being a, a company being successful now is no guarantee that it will be successful in the, in the future. C is correct. And let's look at D. Just why not? D. An amateur stock investor will automatically make more money than a professional. This is illogical. It doesn't make sense at all. Let's look at number 30. This is about laissez-faire economics. Go ahead, pause the video, read the short blurb, look at the options of which we can choose for the, the boxes. Okay. Laissez-faire is an economic envir environment in which transactions between private parties are largely free from government restrictions. So choose three characteristics that best exemplify laissez-faire economics. Deregulation. Uh, deregulation would be one of the choices, yes, because it would be stopping government control of the economy. So we would drag A into the first box. B, labor laws. Labor laws would be regulation from the government, and this would not be part of the characteristics of a laissez-faire economic system. C, building codes. Again, same thing. These are control codes. D, free trade. Yes, free trade would be part of that. We would drag D up into the box. E, antitrust laws. Again, antitrust laws would be government control and not consistent with laissez-faire economics. F, non-interference. It states up the, it states exactly that, non-interference. So we would drag F up into the third box. This is another type of question to drag and drop. You should be familiar with these. Number 31. Number 31 asks us to look at this image, read the quick passage, read the answers, and determine uh, which one we believe make an inference about the situation. So go ahead, pause it, infer which A, B, C, or D you think is correct, and let's see. Okay, I think you've had time to read it and look at this very old black and white photo. So it tells us about the golden age of transatlantic passenger ships. Now it came to an end about 1953. Which of these events can we conclude was probably the likely cause of that? A. A series of highly publicized liner accidents made the ships too, made the public too nervous to take ships. That could be true. B. Uh, B. A major war made overseas travel impossible. If you've been studying the history section, you know that 1953 was after World War II, and we were no, not in any major wars. That's not true. C. The advent of passenger airlines cut down the time it took to get to Europe, leaving ships outmoded. That makes a lot of sense. That seems like the most likely uh, answer so far, but let's look at D. D. The cost of travel by boat became prohibitively expensive. Usually the price of travel will go down with time as it becomes more available, so that does not make sense. C is the correct answer. C is the most likely disruptive force in transportation in 1953. So in this cartoon, we're looking at two Americans, one of African-American descent and one of Caucasian descent, 
and we have a passage, uh, sorry, a quote, and a title. A man knows a man. Give me your hand, comrade. We have each lost a leg for the good cause, but thank God we have never lost heart. If we notice that they're shaking hands, they're smiling, they use comrade, which would be indicating a positive relationship, and the clever use of the capital L in leg, G in God, and H in heart draws emphasis to those. Let's look at the question. This cartoon from the Civil War era depicts two veterans of the Civil War, which was fought over the emancipation of African American slaves, greeting each other. What did the cartoonist mean to imply by this caption? So the caption is the quote. These two men were equals in each other's eyes. This makes the most sense. They use comrade, they talk about both losing something, and they're shaking hands and greeting each other cordially. B, these two soldiers had lost their legs, and that had, who had lost their legs were not to be pitied because they were still men. This does not make sense. It talks about keeping heart. C, these soldiers had previously met. Doesn't seem so. They're introducing themselves. D, although they may have met before, these veterans had nothing in common. Well, they have a lot in common. They lost a leg fighting for their country. So, A is the most appropriate answer. Okay, so for the, the last three questions on this test, we're going to look at this flow chart about checks and balances. Go ahead and pause the video and have a look at that. Read all of the information. Know which branch can do what things. We also have two tabs, which are quotes from Justice John Marshall, uh, Marshall in 1803 about the case of Madbury, uh, Madbury versus Madison, and Thomas Jefferson in response to Madbury versus Madison. Go ahead and pause and read those, and we'll look at the questions. Okay, these are our three questions. 33, what is a primary duty of the legislative branch? And if you looked at it and could remember you probably could remember from your studies before, this is a big portion of the civic session, to pass laws is the correct answer, B. A is not correct, the president vetoes laws, and the other two don't make much sense anyway. 34, what was Thomas Jefferson's opinion of Madbury, uh, Madbury versus Madison? Well, in this we'd have to look at the text and infer. So. Go ahead and have a look at the text again. Pause the video if you'd like. Read tab three. And now let's go look at the question again. A, it balanced federal power by giving federal judges the right to override unjust laws. B, it conferred too much power over the executive branch. C, it made judges as honest as other men. Or D, it gave too much power to the judicial branch. D is what Thomas Jefferson implies and his belief. D is correct. 35. In context, what is the best substitute for the word oligarchy in tab 3? I'm going to go back again let you have a chance to look at tab 3. And we have four words. A. Tyranny. B. Democracy. C. Passion. D. Honesty. And the only one that can make sense in this context is A, tyranny. Jefferson uses negative words such as dangerous to imply that it's a unwelcomed con concentration of power. Okay, that concludes this example of our GED social studies exam. I wish you guys the best of luck in passing your exams and thanks for watching.